Greetings everybody, Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is November 15th, 2020, uh, the Corona Beer Party. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have a feeling that everybody's going to look back on this and this will be the last good year the EU, UK, and USSA, I mean USA, or is it you, uh, the Union of Soviet Socialist, uh, Union of Socialist States America, well, soon to be, after that great reset, they call it. Um, uh, this will be probably the last good year. You know, I was reading um, about the uh, cities that they had built in China, and they were empty. They had entire cities built, and they're empty. And I thought, hmm, well, what's going on with that? That doesn't make any sense. But you know what? When you look at Agenda, um, you know, uh, when you're of legal drinking age, uh, yeah, when you're 21, well, most, many states, maybe not most, but many states, 21. Um, you know, they're going to move people out of the rural, rural, more rural areas and move them into these cities. Well, the ones that survive the coming um, hollow that costs, and uh, by the way, that word means a burnt offering in Hebrew. Yeah, did you know that? A burnt offering. But um, by whatever means they do, whether they unleash a disease or they cook us with the uh, G whiz one, two, three, four, five, or by war or by whatever, but I have a feeling one of the reasons why they closed the national parks is so that they could hide uh, foreign troops so that if there's riots in this country that uh, they can quickly deploy um, people that will actually open, well, that will do whatever the evil ones at the top want to do to those that don't submit if you catch my drift um you know an american soldier might not want to do certain things to american citizens but uh, people's liberation army of china oh they'll have no problem because they hate us anyways so but that's just you know, some thoughts. So let's read Ezekiel chapter 14. This Bible study is called These Three Men. These Three Men. I did a Bible study on um, I, Ezekiel 14, but um, it was called uh, Judgment Upon the Wicked Land. But... Uh, this is a heavy this is a heavy verse. You won't ever hear this preached at Joel Olstein's uh, country club. Verse one. Get your King James Bible and go to Ezekiel chapter fourteen. Ezekiel is one of them books that people people just don't they just don't read. Oh, and all of you that uh, have copies of my work, uh like I say, I don't copyright anything. It's it all belongs to the Lord. I you know, please warn the sheep. You know, I mean, I'm not the only one, but you know, somebody's got to tell these idiots, uh, lazy idiots that won't read their Bibles, and and if and if you don't, you know, Bible says to study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And they think dispensational uh, theology is rightly dividing. 
Yeah, every clear verse in Scripture, they explain it away. They call that rightly dividing. Uh, and the pre-trib rapture and, you know, that's going to be the downfall of probably millions of churchgoers. You know, I, I, honestly, people have not counted the cost. Jesus said to take up your cross and follow me. And what did uh, what was Christ's end? He got nailed to that cross. You know, take up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. I mean, come on, people. You know, these uh and these will be the ones that when the when the rabbis uh, say that we're uh, following a false messiah, they'll be the first ones to uh, turn us in. Believe me. And oh, by the way, that was in Luke 9, 23. And he, Jesus, said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Oh, yeah. Matthew 16, 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I mean, uh, won't we keep reading? Yeah, Mark 8, 34. You know, there you go. All right, so back to Ezekiel 14. So like I say, if you uh, get a chance and you want to lower your social uh, credit score, post post the, anything you think would be appropriate online. Uh, you know, you got all these Paul deniers, uh, Hebrew roots people, uh, the Yeshua crowd, the pre trib rapture people. Everybody that thinks um, Rome is Mystery Babylon, when the Bible tells you that Mystery Babylon killed the prophets, uh, nobody can show me in the Bible where God sent any prophets to Rome. No. And you know who the whore is? The harlot of Revelation? It's apostate Jerusalem. I mean, you know, Rome, when, when Paul started out, Rome was okay. But, you know, that was a long, long, long time ago. So, and I'm not saying Rome is innocent. No, by no means. Um, I actually liked Pope John Paul when he said he was going to sell all the gold and they had and give to the poor, I thought, wow, if that happens, I'm going to become a Catholic. And I didn't even believe in God then. I was half joking, but, but uh, he, uh, his uh, physical sister um, found out that there was a lie that he had been, uh, she suspected murder, and they said he died in the bed, but she knew she had found out that he had been moved and that there was lying involved and then she started doing an investigation and then they put her in a mental hospital and some of the family had to go and actually break her out and she had to go into hiding that's if the story i heard was true which i wouldn't doubt nothing surprises me but uh now the vatican is just getting worse and worse and worse and then you had pope rat hitler youth and, uh, well, you can't really pin that on him because, you know, uh, if you'd have lived in Germany, you were in the Hitler Youth. That's uh, just the way it was. I mean, there was no getting around it. It's going to be kind of like uh, when they, uh, whoever the president-elect is, when he uses the military in a powerful way to make sure everybody gets vaccinated. It's along those lines, yeah. So... All right, let's do Ezekiel 14. So, yeah, please uh, feel free to post Bible studies online anywhere you can or uh, 
whatever. And uh, by the way, you can uh, even, uh, there's a way to turn uh, voice to text and then you could print the uh, studies out, make a hard copy. Um, I have a feeling that if there's riots uh, over the elections or whatever, or the economy collapses or whatever, and there's riots, they will cut off the internet so that we can't communicate with each other. Uh, but that's just my guess. And they love to pull this stuff in the winter because, you know, they can cut off your heat. I mean, all they got to do is punch in a few things and they can cut your, you know, everybody in the U.S. has these smart meters. And your power goes out and it's below zero and you got no heat, you know. Uh, oh, your social credit score, you posted Chaplin Bob Online, you got a minus uh, 1,000 credit score, social media credit score. So we're going to cut your heat off and hope you freeze to death. Yeah. Yeah, I remember when I was living in Colorado, the people would be driving on the interstate or back highway or something, and then a freak storm would come, and uh, roads would ice up, and then they would slide off into the highway into a pile of snow, and then uh, the car would run out of gasoline, or whatever and then uh, the people would they find them frozen after the snow melted frozen to death no sleeping bags no blankets no food no water idiots you know you're not prepared really you know you're going out in the middle of winter I mean and you got no nothing for your family are you stupid you know that's what you call the Darwin Awards I mean when I lived in Colorado I always had a gallon of water and a blanket sleeping bag. I always had that stuff. Always, 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 especially in the winter because you just don't know. So, you know, these people are evil. You know, I mean, there's actually people out there that believe that uh, everybody can be saved. And that's fine. You want to believe that, that's fine. But you know what? You're in a war. And you don't even know who the enemy is. Uh, that, which means you're going to lose. You know, at least if you're in a war and you know who the enemy is, you got a chance. Well, if the Lord's on your side, you're definitely going to win. But uh, when, when you're in a war and you don't even know who the enemy is, pfft, you're done. And that's the thing. We're in a, a war, physically and spiritually, and... Most churchgoers don't even know who the enemy is. Uh, whatever. I, You know. And they won't even study to find out. So up, that's up to them. All right. Ezekiel 14. King James Bible, please. All right. So Ezekiel is... Uh, he's hanging out. And uh, let's read. Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me and sat before me. All right, Ezekiel's a prophet, right? Verse 2. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart. They've got wickedness in their heart, right? And put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them in other words should i should the these people be asking me anything they're evil they're wicked why are they coming to me you know well let them go ask satan you know uh, well that's kind of the bob commentary there verse four therefore speak unto them and say unto them thus saith the lord god Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity or evil or sin or wickedness, that's what iniquity means, um, and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to the prophet, 
I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols. Oh yeah, you want to come to me with your sin and wickedness? Well, that's how I'm going to answer you, with sin and wickedness. Verse 6, Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent. Repent of what? Their unbelief? No. Repent of their wickedness, right? Repent and turn yourself from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. Wow. What's an abomination? Uh, that's a sin that's an extra special sin that God really, 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 really hates. H with a capital H. Hates. That's a sin that God really hates. I mean, there's sin and then there's abominations. And uh, I can think of two. Sodomy is one and witchcraft is another. Those are abominations. For, verse 7, For every one of the house of Israel, or of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel, which separateth himself from me, so they separate themselves from the Lord, okay, and setteth up his idols in his heart, and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me, I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. Ooh. And I will set my face against that man. And I and will make him a sign and a proverb. And I will cut him off. Ooh, that don't sound good. And I will cut him off from the midst of my people. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. Wow, listen to this. This is ah, oh, this this is scary. You know, I've had people say um that these TV preachers that teach all this false stuff uh they ask me, well, you know, do these people know they're teaching lies? I wonder. Sometimes I think they actually believe it. Cuz listen to this. Verse 9. And if the prophet be deceived, when he hath spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. You know, I've had people say, oh, God would never deceive us. If you got enough sin in your life, yes, he will. Says it so right here. In my King James Bible, um, you know, and there's all kinds of satanic trolls all over these Christian sites that spread these lies. I quote stuff like this, and, and they're quick to point out, oh, that's that King James, that's wrong. Or, that was Old Testament. That doesn't apply to us now. We're under grace. I had just had somebody today rebuke me because I don't love Satan. God said to love your enemies. I'm like, what? Yeah, we're to love our enemies. Are we to, supposed to love God's enemies? Really? So I told him, well, I'm certain you do love Satan. And I po quoted a couple verses, but yeah, they're Old Testament. But um, the Bible says Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So they actually want you to think that uh, the Old Testament God is totally different than the New Testament God. Uh, I don't think so. But yeah, those kind of people... They do love Satan. They do. But, um, yeah. I, I just, yeah. There, there's just so many. You, you wouldn't believe it. There are, when I was studying Satanism, my first, basically my first year in the Lord, I did not want to be deceived. So I studied Satanism from 
their books. I wasn't reading these so-called Christian books about Satanism. No. I went to their books. And they encouraged attractive witches to seduce the pastors. Seriously. You know, um, to destroy the ministry. Uh, and... Um, and that thing I was telling you about Calvary Chapel in Fort Lauderdale, I don't, that wasn't what she was doing. She was going for the money. But, you know, you get an attractive woman that's, you know, early 20s and uh, takes him to a hotel room with a camera set up, and then, you know, you can destroy somebody's ministry. I mean, that's it. It's gone, you know. But... Uh, They'll try bribing them, uh, poisoning them. Uh, they they were even telling you what to do. I mean, they even, because uh, they knew their magic spells didn't work against Christians. I found that very telling. I even challenged some uh, witches to cast a spell on me, and they even admitted, oh, well, spells don't work on Christians. But... Uh, they, uh, you know, this is the kind of stuff they tell them to do. And they tell them to infiltrate the seminaries or cemeteries to become ministers and preachers so that they can destroy the church from within. And what kills me is these baby Christians think, Oh, well, you know, they just don't, you know, this minister, yeah, he doesn't have all his theology right, but you know what, he's, uh, you know, he's just, he's just a baby, and he's trying to win souls to Christ. No, they're deceivers. A lot of them. You know, if they were real, God would show them the truth. You know, I don't knowingly, I'm, I'm probably wrong on some things, but I don't do it out of deceit I don't lie to people on purpose I, I'm going to have to give an account to the Lord every word that I've ever put out of my mouth concerning teachings that's scary people and, and we're not just you know those of us that teach we're going to be held to a higher standard I didn't want to teach you think I like being called names and and uh be threatened and get death threats well i don't get death threats anymore but uh the first few months when i started uh doing this i was getting death threats all the time and i was like well pff, boy i must be doing something right so you know can you imagine that they t they purposely tell their devils to infiltrate the churches to destroy them from within um, there's an, uh, there, this has happened so many times. Um, I'm going to give you an example. An attractive woman will go and tell a, a, a pastor, oh, I need some counseling. And, uh, they would get the pastor alone and then claim that he tried to seduce her or rape her or whatever. And it's happened so many times that the, um, now, they always make sure that there's, well, they may not have persons sit in the, the very same room, but a room next door, like a secretary or a, an assistant pastor or whatever, just so that those allegations don't hold water, because it's just an unwritten rule. And, uh, you know, let's face it, there was a... a uh, sodomite magazine in the 70s I think somebody showed it to me I don't remember um, it was a sodomite magazine in the 70s and uh, no I wasn't looking at the pictures but uh, they wrote an article and uh, it said to uh, for the sodomites to uh, go to the Catholic seminary to be able to destroy the church from within well, what have we been having since, you know, the 90s and 2000s and, you know, uh, all kinds of pedophile 
accusations against the Catholic Church. And I'll guarantee you, a lot of them are probably true. You know, They're, they take this stuff seriously. But uh, somebody showed me this article where they were encouraged, you know, sodomites become, you know, Catholic priests. Yeah. These people are evil. They're devils. So, verse 9. Ezekiel 14 and verse 9. And if the Joel Osteen be deceived, oh, I'm sorry. And if the prophet be deceived when he hath spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand upon him and will destroy him, and will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. Is that some harsh words? Oh, yeah. And they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh after him. So when you got a deceiving prophet and he's punished, the people that go after Joel Osteen, same thing. Verse 11 that the house of Israel may go no more astray from me, neither be polluted any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people, and I may be their God, saith the Lord God. Now remember, Ezekiel is a prophet. I think he was a contemporary with Jeremiah and Isaiah. Around the time that... Um, Jerusalem was taken into captivity by Babylon. Now remember, they didn't all go into captivity. Uh, Babylon killed a lot of people. I don't know what the percentages were, but they killed a lot of people. And uh, yeah, yeah. Verse 12. Now, think about this sinful land. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously. Now, we're talking about the people, right? Then will I stretch out mine hand upon it, and will break the staff of the bread thereof and will send famine upon it and will cut off man and beast from it. Cutting off man and beast. So not only are the people going to die in the famine, but the animals are going to die also. What happens when your cattle die? Well, you ain't going to be eating no steak that night. Verse 14. Now remember, the Bible study's name was These Three Men. Verse 14. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, so if these three men are in the land when the Lord sends his punishment and judgment upon it, though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. Now, why Noah, Daniel, and Job? Well, we're going to take a look at the life of Noah we're going to take a look at the life of Daniel, and we're going to take a look at the life of Job. I'm not going to do a big in-depth study, but we'll cover, you know. Verse 15. If I cause noisome beasts to pass through the land, are these two-legged beasts or four-legged beasts? If I cause noisome beasts to pass through the land, 
and they spoil it so that it be desolate, that no man may pass through because of the beast. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters. They only shall be delivered, but the land shall be desolate. So when the Lord is angry and sends his judgments upon the land, uh, Noah, Daniel, and Job, he wouldn't, the Lord's not going to spare their sons or their daughters. Just them three. Can you imagine that? Verse 17. Or if I bring a sword. What's a sword? War. Or if I bring a sword upon that land and say, Sword, go through the land, so that I cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters, but they only shall be delivered themselves. Or if I send a pestilence into that land. What is pestilence? Well, it's where you get the word pest. Um, the black plague, the bubonic plague, that's a pestilence. Uh, any kind of, you know, smallpox. Uh, any kind of disease that wipes people out. You know, the, um, the Black Death, the bubonic plague, according to history, approximately 25% of Europe died from the bubonic plague. They called it the Black Death. Uh, so think about that. Forgive me there, I'm starting to get hoarse. And no, not a H-O-R-S-E that you ride on. No, my voice is getting hoarse. I've done a couple of Bible studies. And yeah, maybe I'm a little uh, dehydrated. I don't know. So great. I'm getting hoarse with my voice. And my hands sometimes get carpal tunnel. So I'm a mess. Whatever. All right. So verse 19. So the Lord's mad, or if I send a pestilence into that land and pour out my fury, and pour out my fury upon it in blood. What is blood? Death, right? And pour out my fury upon it in blood to cut off from it man and beast. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, but they uh, they shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. Ah, okay, so Noah, Daniel, and Job had righteousness. You know, I've heard people uh, teaching Bible stuff and they're like, you know, well, grace just means all we got to do is believe. But, you know, we're not saved by works. And I'm not saying that. But if you really do believe, your works are going to follow what you believe. I mean, you know, you know, charity. Are you greedy for every penny or... Are you a giving person? You see somebody on the street that looks like they haven't eaten in a couple days. And I'm sorry, not all um, homeless people are drug addicts. I Back years ago, I pretty much thought that. But I don't today. Uh-uh. People are losing their jobs. They're losing their homes. Uh, a lot of people are three or four weeks away from being homeless. And this, uh, uh, this beer thing going on, boy, I tell you what, we are under God's righteous indignation and judgment. Verse 21, 
For thus saith the Lord God, how much more? Well, let me let me let me tell you something. Righteousness is by our actions. You know, the Lord said the uh, the two commandments: love the Lord and love thy neighbor. You know, when you see your neighbor gets hurt in an accident, and you know you go and they can't uh, go do things. You know, so you you bring them food. You <clears throat> excuse me, maybe help tend their gardens or whatever. That is loving your neighbor. You know, and James, you know what? Read James chapter 2. James grew up with a guy named Jesus. He had a father named Joseph, and he had a mother named Mary. I think James knew a couple things about faith and works. James chapter 2, he writes that fa uh, works, faith without works was dead being alone. And you're not saved by your works. Your works follow faith. Works are proof of your faith. Read James chapter 2. Don't take my word on it. I've got a Bible study on it. I don't know how long I'm going to be here on YouTube, but uh, yeah. You know, works are proof of what you believe. You know, really. So, all right. Verse 21. For thus saith the Lord God, How much more when I send my four sword judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword, war, and the famine, and the noisome beast, and the pestilence or disease to cut off from it man and beast. Yet behold, therein shall be left a remnant that shall be brought forth, both sons and daughters. Behold, they shall come forth unto you, and ye shall see their way and their doings, and ye shall be comforted concerning the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem, even concerning all that I have brought unto you upon it. That I have and all that I brought upon it. And they shall comfort you when ye shall see their ways and their doings, and ye shall know that I have not done it without cause, all that I have done in it, saith the Lord God. So why did the Lord do all this? Because they were evil. You know, I never wanted to teach, but I was convicted. You know, because it's, it's a lot of responsibility. And I'm telling you, when I was a kid, that was a dirty word, responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. I didn't want responsibility. I was carefree and fun-loving. And, and uh, unfortunately, the mother of my kids got tired of waiting for me to grow up. So... I think she'd have waited another year or two. Uh, she'd probably, uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, that's the reason why in the, the Bible, a uh, high priest, the high priest could never be the high priest under 30 years old. Because, you know, guys don't grow up until close to that time. You know? Uh, the gals, gals seem to grow up a lot quicker. I've met girls 16, 18 years old that were more mature than guys 25 years old. I don't know why that is, but it just is. So what can I tell you? All right. So why is it that the Lord says he would spare Noah, Daniel, and Job? Why is that? All right. Let's take a look. All right, let's go to jo Genesis, Genesis chapter 6. Boy, I got a whole playlist on this, Genesis 6. 
Verse 1, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. Now, it tells you right here, men and daughters. Okay? That word men and man is the same word in the Hebrew as Adam. Adam is a uh, let's see, in the Strong's Hebrew, it's word 119, 120, 121, and 122. Okay? Men, man, and Adam. And then you got daughters. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God... Now, why would it say sons of God in one place and men in the other? And your demon nominational preachers will make you think, well, you know, these men were just unbelievers, and then these sons of God are believers. Uh, I don't think so, but, you know. Uh, if you want to know who these sons of God are, read Job 38, where it tells you that the sons of God shouted for joy at the foundation of the earth. Well, guess what? In the Bible, the earth was created first. And then six days later, Adam was formed of the earth. Now, how did Adam shout for joy at the creation of the earth before he had a body? He didn't have vocal cords. So he couldn't shout, could he? But when you read... Genesis 1 and 2, uh, there's no indication of where, to me, that I can find. There's no indication that I know of where it says that God created the angels. My opinion is God created the angels prior to the earth. How long? I don't know. Maybe in our terms, thousands of years. Maybe 30 minutes before? I don't know. But there's nowhere in Genesis 1 or 2 that I can tell where the angels were formed. No. Job 38 tells you that the sons of God shouted for joy at the foundation or the creation of the earth. Six days later, Adam, man, was formed. God breathed the breath of life into him and he became a living soul. I do not believe sons of God is talking about men. I think they're angels. That's why I like the King James Bible, because the Bible interprets the Bible. It's not, thus saith Bob Walker. No. It's, thus saith the Scriptures. Thus saith the Lord. And I use the Bible to interpret the Bible. And if you don't like that, well, I'm sorry, you could take it up with Jesus when you meet him, whether at the judgment seat of Christ or at the white throne judgment. But, so, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. Verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be a hundred and twenty years. See, prior to this, people like Methuselah lived nine hundred and something years old. Now God says, Nope, his day shall be a hundred and twenty years. Uh, if you live to be a hundred, you made eighty, well, I don't know exactly what the percentage is, but uh, approximately, what, close to 80%? I don't know. Verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. Goliath, anybody? Huh? Yeah. And these Bible preachers want you to believe that Godly men married these ungodly women, and they had giants for children. Uh, do you see any giants running around? You know, notwithstanding the NBA. But, I mean, seriously? 
you know, and then and then what did God tell David? You know, what did God tell him to do with Goliath and the Philistines? Uh, go preach the gospel to them. Tell them how much Jesus loves them. Uh, no, he said to exterminate them, get rid of them, kill everything that breatheth, if I remember correctly. Right? I mean, today, uh, you know, they would have King David holding, throw down his sling and his stones and saying, but Goliath, Jesus loves you. And he wants you to believe in him and be saved. And Goliath would chop his, lop his head off and hold it up in victory. Yeah, that's the, um, that's the uh, Billy Goat Graham uh, gospel. Yeah, God loves everybody. Praise a Jesus. I don't think so. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, during the, during the flood and after the flood, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Who were these men of renown? Hercules, Thor. They were the children of when the gods came down and married the human women. Every legend, every culture in the world has a legend about this. Jack and the Beanstalk. Right? You know, go, um, Paul Bunyan and Babe. Uh, you know, come on, people. The Frost Giants, Norse legends. And uh, they want you to think that, oh, yeah, you know, Jesus loves these people. He wants to save them. I don't think so. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he'd made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. And don't make the mistake of thinking God repenting and man repenting means the same thing. It don't. God does not have sin to repent of. Man does. But if you listen to Stephen Anderson, you'll be taught that it is, means the same thing. Verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. What? But Chaplain Bob, I've always been taught that there's no grace in the Old Testament. Well, I know. That's what they demon nominational teachers, you know, oh, there's no grace in the Old Testament. It's nothing but law, 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 law. You know, follow the commandments, follow these rules. No. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations. What is generations? It means children. Generate. Gene. G-E-N-E. -E, genetics. DNA. Boy, I tell you what, mention that stuff in a Bible study uh, when they're doing on Genesis 6 and uh, watch how quickly you'll be shown the door because one of those witches or warlocks or sorcerers will be in that church and they got to make sure that you don't know who they are. Oh, you got to leave. You're, you're divisive. Yeah, I've heard that a couple times. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man. He was honorable. 
He walked in the ways of the Lord. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. He was perfect in his bloodline, unlike the rest of the world. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Wow. Ah, okay, so now you know why those three men. Noah. Okay. Well, now we know about Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations, and he walked with God. What about Daniel? The word Dan means judge. And E-L, like Danielle, um, has reference to God. So, God the judge or judge of God. Something along those lines. I'm not exactly 100% sure the meaning of Daniel, but it's either God is my judge or uh, the judge of God, or something along those lines. So don't hold me to it. I don't know everything. Matter of fact, D Jesus didn't know everything either. Did you know that? The disciples asked Jesus what day he would come back. And he says he didn't know, the angels in heaven didn't know, but only the Father knew. So you better believe if there's something Jesus don't know, there's a lot of things I don't know. So unless the Lord reveals it to you. Now let me prove that. Matthew 24, verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Hey, Jesus, look at all these, this magnificent temple that evil, wicked King Herod's been working on for, whatever, 40-something years. Verse 2. And Jesus said unto them, See not all these things. Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Listen carefully. Tell us. When shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Jesus answered and said unto them, Oh yeah, the pre-trib rapture. No. He said, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. All right, let's skip to verse 34. Now remember, he's talking about the end time stuff. Jesus speaking. Verse 34, Matthew 24, 34. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away. Somebody tell the, the uh, what they call the preterists that say all these things have to be fulfilled, that they all happened in the past. Well, do we still have the same earth and heavens? Uh, yeah. So it hasn't all been fulfilled yet. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Now, there's Bible people that are supposedly teaching the Bible, and they say, well, you know, the Bible's corrupted. It's, all Bibles are corrupted. We don't, we, don't, we don't know what really what Jesus said. Well, they're turning Jesus into a liar. He said, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and hour, what day and hour? When the Lord returns. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So Jesus doesn't know, no, but no man knows, and not the angels of heaven. Well, guess what? The Jehovah's Witnesses uh, picked at least, I've heard, I've heard five dates. They picked one date that I know of for myself in the 70s. They said Christ would return by 75, 76. Well, sorry, they were wrong. He still he hasn't made it here yet. Well, and then they go, well, yeah, he's here, but he's, he's ruling and reigning invisibly. Oh, okay. I guess he's got a Romulan cloaking device. That's a little uh, Star Trek reference for you people. 
Um, and then you had uh, the Millerites. Um, I think that was the Church of Christ. I'm not sure. Seventh Day Adventists. You know, they all came from that group. Um, yeah. So they don't. You know, they were. It was called the Great Disappointment. I think it was 1844, if memory serves me correctly. And then they had another one. You know, everybody sold all their stuff and was up on the mountains going, oh, Jesus, I know you're coming, so here I am. I want to be closer to you, so I'm on top of this mountaintop, and I sold everything and gave it to the poor or whatever. Or, uh, you know, I gave everything to the church. Yeah. You know, a lot of people did that to the Jehovah's Witnesses. You know that? They sold their homes and gave the money to the witnesses. And then when Jesus didn't come in 75, 76, they were like, man, I hate it when that happens. Darn. Yeah, they lost, uh, from what I read, they lost about a quarter of their membership. I wonder why. Well, you're idiots. So, but of that day and hour knoweth no man. Uh, what was the guy's name? Um, I forget. He was predicting the Lord was going to come back. Uh, one pre-tribber said 88 reasons why the Lord will return in 1988. That was a big thing back then. Um, oh, gosh, I forget. There was another guy just recently that died, and he predicted Christ would come back twice. Uh, come on, people. You know, ugh. But of that day and hour knoweth no man. And oh, by the way, the Bible says to stone false prophets. Yeah, we should... We should, uh, we should heed what the Bible says. Be Hebrew roots people. Yeah, that's, that's Torah. Let's keep the Torah. You know, there'll be a lot less false prophets in this world. But uh, Harold Camping. I knew I'd had to look that up. I had to pause the uh, thing and look it up. All right, so. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, Noe, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days they were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving a marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And then it says, the, you know, two will be in the field, one will be taken, and the other left. Well, pre-tribbers say that we're, you know, the pre-trib rapture people are going to be the ones taken. Well, guess what, people? At the end of the flood, who was taken and who was left? At the end of the flood, the wicked were taken and drowned, and Noah was left behind. <laughs> Think about that. The pre-tribbers have got it all backwards. Oh, yeah. All right, so what's up with Daniel? Now, remember, um, Daniel used to pray three times a day. You know, even Muslims pray three times a day, called a prayer. I mean, you know, as as bunch of heathens that they are, deceived as they are, um, you know, how many Christians pray three times a day? I don't pray three times a day. I, I'll admit it, you know, I try to at least twice. But, um, you know, Daniel prayed three times a day, at least. Daniel 9.23 at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Now, this is an angel. I believe an angel talking to him. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Daniel was greatly beloved. Remember, he was in the lion's den, right? And the Lord spared him. Boy, I'll tell you what. The Lord had a plan for Daniel's life. And you know, he was one of the princes of Judah, Judah and Jerusalem. 
he was taken into captivity and he was made into a eunuch if uh well because he was put into the charge of the prince of the eunuchs do the math okay it doesn't say they made him a eunuch but he was you know when you're in the king's household and he the king's got his harem and he wants to make sure you're not playing with any of his women there's only one way to do make sure of that and uh, so I'm and Daniel is nowhere recorded in the Bible as having children so do the math okay but did he complain no he was one of the princes of Judah and even though bad things happened to him and he was taken into captivity he was evidently righteous before the Lord how about Daniel 10 and 19 another I think it's another angel talking to him and said O man greatly beloved fear not peace be unto thee be strong yea be strong and when he had spoken unto me I was strengthened and said let my Lord speak for thou hast strengthened me and I'm sorry I should have read uh, Daniel 10 11 first before I read 10 19 but and he said unto me O Daniel a man greatly beloved understand the words that I speak unto thee and stand upright for unto thee am I now sent and when he had spoken these words unto me, I stood trembling. I think if I saw an angel, I'd be trembling too. So, all right. So that's why Daniel was greatly beloved. He didn't complain about um, the bad things that happened to him. He was taken into captivity, um, you know, and... Um, Yet he still loved the Lord and prayed three times a day. And I'm sure he fasted and prayed and, you know, was just righteous all around and was honest in all his dealings. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's the testimony we should have, right? He was given wisdom in dreams and visions. Remember, he interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Yeah. And he rebuked Nebuchadnezzar, and he rebuked his son Belshazzar, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. So Daniel, Daniel, as far as the Lord was concerned, had it going on, I guess you could say. All right, what about Job? Well, let's take a look at Job. Now, there are people, uh, scholars, I should say, uh, who say that Job is probably the first book in the Bible written before Genesis. That would not surprise me. I am of that opinion. I used to think that, well, maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong, but um, I think it's correct. But uh, I'm not sure if Job is even uh, where Job is in the genealogy. I'd have to look that up. Boy, this that genealogy, you can go... You know, the, the Bible says not to, um, not to mind endless genealogies. I mean, you know, you could go through how many millions of people in the world, you know? And we're not talking about Ancestry.com or 23andMe, but uh, just Bible genealogy. We could go over that over and over and over. But uh, Job, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect. What? Wow. And that man was perfect. I wonder if Job wrote this, huh? I don't think so, but maybe, maybe, I don't know. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. You know what eschewed means? It means hates, avoids, 
stays away from. One that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. All right, so. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. Sounds like Job and his wife were kind of busy there. Verse 3. His substance also was 7,000 sheep. How many people would you need and how much land would you need to feed 7,000 sheep? Are you going to have one shepherd for 7,000 sheep? I don't think so. You're going to have a crew, a large crew. Seven sons is not going to cover 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels, and 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 she-asses, and a very great household. I mean, can you imagine the garden that this guy has uh, just to feed his family and his uh, household? So that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. Ah, wow. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day. Some people say that's the birthday. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and went, I'm sorry, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. You know, Job was only worried about his sons. And, uh, some Bible teachers will, fake Bible teachers will say, see, Job only cared about his sons. He didn't care about his daughters. He, he sacrificed for his sons, but there's no mention of his daughters because he didn't care about them. Uh, is that true? Uh, maybe his sons were um, a lot less righteous than the daughters. Maybe the daughters were godly daughters and they didn't need for him to, you know, do sacrifices and be concerned about them. You know, maybe the daughters were righteous. Maybe the sons were not. You know, I don't know. But uh, people will say, oh, Job was horrible. He, he didn't care about his daughters. He didn't sacrifice for them. Ugh. Verse 6. Ah, here's another thing about the uh, sons of God. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now people will tell, have told me that this is proof that the uh, the the uh, fallen angels were cast out of heaven in the future during the revela uh, in Revelation during the uh, tribulation period. We'll take a look at that real quick. All right, this is in uh, Revelation 12 and verse 7. And there was, past tense, was, and there was war in heaven. War in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. So the dragon and his angels prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Back to Job 1. Uh, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. 
and Satan came also among them. That's clue number two that the sons of God here are angels. Now, people, I've heard people say that this is proof that Satan hasn't been cast out of heaven yet because they're presenting themselves before the Lord. Well, possibly. I'm not saying they're wrong 100% because I don't know, but consider this. Where does it say they're in heaven? It doesn't. Does it say they're on earth? It doesn't. Could they be in heaven? Possibly. But could they be on earth? And then the Lord's here. Possibly. I don't know. Uh, personally, my opinion, and I'm not the final authority. The Bible is. But I think they were cast out in the past. And the Lord just happened to be on the earth. And the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. But, hey, that's just my guess. Verse 7. And the Lord said unto Satan, What's up, big dog? What's up, big doggy dog? What's happening? Well, that's the, uh, the, new, the new living perversion translation. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence camest thou? So, where are you coming from? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Eh, from going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. You know, I'm just walking around, hanging out, checking things out, you know. And the Lord said unto Satan, verse 8, Hast thou considered my servant Job? That there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Oh, yeah? Ah, I got a bet for you, Lord. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Yeah, does, does Job fear you for nothing? Hast thou, has not thou made an hedge about him and about his house? Yeah, God put a fence around Job. A fence to keep Satan away, right? I did a Bible study called The Hedge. Should check it out while, you know, that little uh, magnifying glass at the top where it says search, the hedge. Yeah. Hast thou, has not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Ah, so he can do everything except to kill Job. Verse 13. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans, or the Arabs, and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Oh yeah, those peace-loving Arabs, they came and stole them all. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. You see, you got servants, you know, you got thousands of sheep and hundreds of oxen plowing. You better believe you got servants, you know, 500 yoke of oxen. How many servants would you need to use those to plow? I mean, you're talking miles and miles of land with that much, you know, to be able to feed everybody. Oh, boy. Verse 16, And while he was yet speaking, there came an, also another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven. Now, this guy doesn't realize that the fire of uh, fell from heaven was from Satan. God didn't do this. I, my opinion. 
I believe Satan did this. God is allowing Satan to bring fire down from heaven. And guess what? The false prophet in the book of Revelation is going to have the same power to bring fire down from heaven. He's going to mimic the miracles of Elijah. I've got an entire Bible study on the life of Elijah, one of the two witnesses in the end times. Yeah. You know, these people that don't know their Bible, when the false prophet comes and brings fire down from heaven, and the you-know-whos are proclaiming that Elijah has come, and Yeshua, the Messiah, Moshiah, has come, they're going to fall for it. Especially when all your TV preachers and your rabbis and everybody else proclaims that even Christ has come, but Christ said that the false Christ would come first. Ugh. But, of course, they deserve... Didn't we read in Ezekiel 14? The false prophets would deserve to be deceived and the people that inquire of them because they live unrighteous lives, the iniquity, their sin, their evilness. While he was yet speaking, verse 16, while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Wow. Verse 17. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Wow. Who are the Chaldeans? They were a branch of the Babylonians. All right, so, um, verse 18. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness. So not only was Satan able to bring fire down from the sky, but also wind. Ah, where do we read that? Well, let's take a look at something real quick. Luke 8, verse 22. Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples, and he said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake, and they launched forth. So here it is, they're on a ship, and they're going to the other side. But as they sailed, he fell asleep, and there came down a storm of wind on the lake. Ah, and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. I wonder who sent this windy storm. Verse 25, And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wonder, saying one to another, what manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and water, and they obey him. And people will tell you, oh, well, Jesus is just a man, just like you and I. I don't think so. When you can walk on water and calm a storm, I want to put you in, a, in front of a hurricane and watch you uh, command the wind and make it stop. When you can do that, I'll believe that you're uh, the same as Christ. But until then, sorry, Charlie, only the best tuna gets to be star-kissed. Job 1.19 And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness. So Satan has power that God allows at times to fulfill God's purpose, right? And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Uh, the young men are dead. I wonder if the daughters survived. 
It doesn't say the daughters are dead. You know, maybe the Lord spared the daughters because they were far more righteous than the sons. I don't know. Verse 20. So what did, uh, what did Job do here? Oh, man, you just lost your sheep, your oxen, your sons. You just lost almost everything, right? What are you going to do? Verse 20. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. How many people would be like that? Wow, people would be cursing God. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Ah, so... You know, when judgment comes upon the land, uh, you know, we should be like uh, Noah. We should be like Daniel. And we should be like Job. Verse 2, chapter 2, I'm sorry. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. Yeah, I've been walking around, checking things out, you know. Verse 3, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There is, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, and still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. Well, maybe the Lord did bring the wind, maybe the Lord did bring the fire down. I'm wondering if, I don't know, possibly. I read this and I'm not sure. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath he will give for his life. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh. He will curse thee to thy faith. face. Oh yeah. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. All right. And so went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job. Ah. And so went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job. So evidently Satan has power to smite you with this stuff. And smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his feet unto his crown. So from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. I don't know if you've ever had boils. I have, and I hear they're extremely painful. And he took a pot shard to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. Um, then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Uh, in other words, are you stupid or what? Curse God and die. Now you wonder why Satan uh, killed his sons. You know, his sons were eat, drink, and be merry. You know, get drunk on wine. But he didn't kill his wife. Why? Boy, how would you like to have a wife like that? No, thank you. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Cursed God and die. Wow. See, Satan left her alive because he wanted to, he was using her, right? Evidently, that's what it looks like to me. I could be wrong, but you know, what do I know? But he, Job, said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. 
So, I think you're going to get the idea. When the Lord sends his four, pass, uh, four, four plagues upon the land, the sword, war, disease, pestilence, famine, and the noisome beast, I wonder if the noisome beast is a two-legged creature like what's flooding Europe and the UK now and America. I wonder, you know, the noisome beast? Um, I wonder if the noisome beast has got four legs or two. I don't know. But when the Lord sends those four things into the land to destroy it because it's evil and wicked and it's judgment and punishment, he'll spare Noah, Daniel, and now we know about Job. These three men. And like I say, I, I got a Bible study on the hedge. You know, check out the playlist. There's a lot of good stuff on the playlist. Yeah, there's a lot of fluff on the playlist, but there's some good stuff in there. I mean, I've learned I've learned a lot going through the years. Every time I do a Bible study, almost seems like every time I do a Bible study, I find something that I never found before. You don't do that with the new Bibles, but you do with the King James. So all righty, all blessings, praise, a glory and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.